Hi, welcome to Limnology. Today we're going to talk about morphology and zonation in lakes. We're going to start with lake morphology. Lake morphology is a term that refers to the shape of a lake, whereas lake morphometry is a term that refers to how we measure the shape and quantify that shape. Um, as we've been talking about previously when we talked about how lakes are formed and the origin of lakes, the size and shape of a lake really can affect nearly all of the physical, chemical, and biological parameters in the lake. So it's really important that we understand what the shape of a lake is and how we can quantify it and compare the shape to the shape of other lakes. So most of you are familiar to some extent with contour maps. I know a lot of ESF students like to go hiking and many of you have probably used contour maps. So you have a good understanding that if you're climbing up say a, a mountain peak on this island and you're looking at the contour map and you reach a region say where this shows very close together lines you know that you're going up a really steep peak and that's going to be hard going. So a topographic map like you would use when you're hiking is really similar and a good analogy to the kind of maps that you'll see for lakes that will help you understand the shape of the lakes. Those maps are called bathymetric map. Bathy means deep, so it's a map of the depths of the lake. And just like a contour map, we have lines that show us a constant uh, depth in this case instead of a constant altitude. And so here you can see uh, for example, a little lake in Florida, and this is one of the isobaths, the lines of equal depth. So if you dove down in this lake and you went to this spot, you would find the same depth at every point along this line. So that's the isobaths. So these bathymetric maps are general descriptive terms, um, and we can use them when we look at them to sort of imagine what the shape of the lake is like. Just we're dr digging a hole instead of walking up a hill. So how do we make these maps? Well, back in the day, um, people used to make them in ways that are pretty easy relate, to relate to, but were really labor intensive. So uh, this is a picture here from the Minnesota Natural, uh, Department of Natural Resources showing uh, some early survey work. And even today, many of the maps that you will find for lakes uh, were generated, say, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when people went out and surveyed lakes and done in this method. So it's important to think about how the map you're looking at was generated because those maps may be of lesser resolution than maps made with a more modern technology. So what did people do? They went out in these boats, they had just simply a line and a weight. Um, they measured the shoreline with surveying techniques. Um, and so they would measure multiple places, they'd know where they were with the classic surveying techniques, and they would estimate then um, the, the depths of the lake at different points. Today we have it a little easier. If you're in a big enough lake that you can take a good sonar unit, you can have GPS connected to a sonar, and you can get a really good indication of where you are spatially on the lake from the GPS and you can get an indication of the depth from your sonar unit. And as many of you probably know, uh, sonar sends a sound signal down to the bottom and it estimates depth by how rapidly the sound signal is then returned from reflecting off the bottom of the lake in this case. So we can get very good indicators and increasingly there are more and more sophisticated sonar instruments um, that allow us to get continuous profiles of the lake. Here's a, an example of a path that people have taken with a boat where they've gone around the whole shoreline, they've surveyed the shoreline using GPS techniques, and then they've made parallel lines across the lake and then in the perpendicular direction, and they've generated this isobathic map from that using various computer algorithms. Some examples of lakes that we talked about when we were looking at Lake Origins and some of their maps are, say, Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe was an example of a Graben Lake. You should think a little bit about how that means it was formed. Uh, if you remember, it was formed by earthquakes and faults. So there were fault lines on both sides and basically the bottom dropped out of the lake. And Lake Tahoe, as you can see, if you look at these isobaths, these are really long, uh, big distances. So this is a 200 meter isobath and this is a 400 meter isobath and then it's very flat at the bottom. 
And so this is a very coarse map, but you could say this is a very deep lake. And it's so deep and flat that if you were to take this in cross section, here's like a very blown up person on a little boat, um, you, could, uh, you could end up having the entire uh, Empire State Building submerged beneath the waters of Lake Tahoe. And the bottom here is very flat. So you get these really close lines, steep sides, and really flat bottom. Steep sides, flat bottom. Another example then of how we can use modern technology to improve this is we can actually go out, people have uh, taken boats with sophisticated sonar, they've gener used computer uh, simulation to generate 3D maps, and we can imagine Lake Tahoe without any water in it. And we can see it's flat, but there are these little uh, structures, perhaps rocks and other things that fell in, erratics, and we can see the depth of the water and the steepness of the hills. One thing also to think about if you've ever been to Lake Tahoe and you can see here from the, the picture is if you're at a lake and you're looking at the shoreline and say it's in a very mountainous region, that's often a clue that perhaps the sides of the lake will be steep. If you're in a very flat region, perhaps there's a clue that the sides of the lake beneath the surface will be shallow as well. So when you're going to a lake, look around, see if you can guess ahead of time what the shape of the lake under the water is like. Here's Crater Lake, which we talked about, um, which was formed volcanically. And you can see this, it's actually a caldera lake, if you remember, not a crater. And you can see this secondary island from another eruption, Wizard Island. And again, really close together lines. And we can convert this into this much nicer technology. And we're sort of as over time, as this technology gets more and more common, there'll be more and more sophisticated maps like this, and it will be really easy to envision what lakes look like. Um, but right now, many of the maps that you'll use are not for lakes that are this large or this famous and don't have this high resolution map. So it's important for you to be able to look at the map on the left, the simple bathymetric map, and sort of imagine what the 3D version of that would be like. So why do we care about measuring these things? These shape parameters can be used for a number of different applications, and I know the, that a lot of you are interested in some of these different parameters. For one, the shape of the lake is going to partly determine the interaction with the watershed. How big is the lake? What's the volume of the lake? You need to know the shape of the lake to calculate that, and that might tell you how many nutrients you could put into the lake before it becomes eutrophied or over nu excess nutrients are loaded into the lake, as we mentioned earlier in class. That can and cause problems for the lake. So if you have a high volume lake, it may be able to accept more nutrients before you see an effect than a very low volume lake. Um, also, uh, we might be able to evaluate the chemical mass balances, how many nutrients are coming in, staying in the lake, leaving. And we can think about the heat balance, so how much of the lake surface uh, and water is exposed to the area where light is coming into the lake. Uh, you may have a, a lake that's very shallow and all of the volume of the lake is near the surface and able to be heated. You may have a lake like Lake Tahoe and Crater Lake that we just saw that's very, very deep. And so only the very surface will be heated and that will affect the heat balance, which will affect the kinds of organisms that can li live in the lake and mixing and other patterns that we'll talk about later in the class. And these things all then interact to determine the biological productivity potential. So how many algae will grow in the lake? How many fish will grow in the lake? Um, and the shape of the lake can also tell us how much shoreline habitat is available for fish. Um, Hawkinson, who you uh, will look at in some of the accessory readings, um, he said, in fact, a nice quote, that shallow areas are a pantry and nursery for the lake. The shallow areas are exposed to the sediments where most of the nutrients are stored, and they have a lot of light. So the shape of the lake will help to tell us about the amount of shoreline, the shallow areas, which those of you interested in fish production and the general biological organisms that might live in the lake will care about. So how do we actually quantify these parameters? Um, it's really important for us to get some common terms, and some of them are really simple. So the first one we'll start with, we're going to start with a number of parameters that are related to the size of the lake. So we'll do size parameters and then the shape of the lake. So size, the first one everyone can relate to, right? Z, which is depth. So we, have, we, we refer to depth as Z and the maximum depth as Z sub M. And you know what the depth is just intuitively. That's how deep the water is. That will obviously change as the water level changes. Um, but then we have length, which is defined specifically, it's often 
uh, used a little l or a capital L to define length. And the length of the lake is the distance on the lake surface between the two most distant points on the lake shore. In some cases, people say the two most distant points on the lake shore that don't intersect an island in the middle of it. And this will become important not just because it tells us something about the size of the lake, but if the maximum length of the lake is oriented in the same direction as the wind, then that gives a lot of lake area and lake distance for the wind to make the lake choppy and affect mixing processes that we'll talk about later in the class. Also, we define the maximum width as uh, if you take lines at right angles or perpendicular to the length line that you've drawn, so you're going perpendicular to that, the one that is the longest um, line that's perpendicular to the length line is the maximum width, which gets a little b for breadth, occasionally a capital B. So those are pretty easy to relate to. You've probably thought about those just as you've been going to a lake. Um, you don't need to really have them further defined. Some of the other characteristics are also easy to relate to, um, but sometimes harder to measure. You need these survey techniques. Uh, the first of these size characteristics is area. So area, we have several possible areas. Um, when we're surveying the lake at different depths and making that iso the, the isobaths and making the, the bathymetric map, um, we can define the area at the surface as A for area sub zero. Um, and then you can think there's an area also of the lake at one meter depth, at two meter depth, at three meter depth. Why might we want to know that? Well, one, we're going to need it to calculate volume. But two, if the water level in a lake is changing, you might want to estimate what's the surface area of the lake if the water level is drawn down, say, in a reservoir or in a drought year, one meter. Um, so the area at any given depth then would be A sub Z, where Z is the actual depth. And so some lakes will be shallower or deeper, but you can use this same conve naming convention for each depth. The next morphometric parameter is volume. Um, volume is easy to remember, it's uh, letter V, uh, and just V itself is the volume of the whole lake. Um, so the volume, if you added the volume, all of the cubic meters or the gallons, if you're not talking proper scientific units in the lake below when it's filled, that would be V. Um, if you want to know the volume below any given depth, so say if we drew the water down in a reservoir one meter, then we might want to know all the water that was contained beneath that one meter, so we know the store in the reservoir for the town then we would, that was using the reservoir, then we would get the, the volume underneath that first depth, and that would be first meter depth, and that would be V sub 1. And often uh, we can estimate this depth um, by knowing the area at the top of one of the depth profiles, say V sub zero, the area at the next one, V sub one, and estimating the volume in between each one as a truncated cone, just using the equation for a truncated cone. We also can calculate some shape parameters for a lake. Um, and shape parameters are uh, often really useful in comparing uh, biological parameters of the lake because the shape parameters, again, will tell you where the majority of the water is. Is it shallow? Is it deep? What's the basin look like? So the first one of those is just mean depth, which is uh, z-bar here, and that's just the average depth of the lake. Um, you don't have to get that by taking the depth at every single point and then averaging those numbers. You can get that simply by dividing the volume of the lake by the surface area of the lake. So if you think about it, that's meters cubed for the volume, meters squared for the area. So meters cubed divided by meters squared gives you meters, which is the average depth of the lake over the whole lake. Um, and this is really related to a number of important factors in lakes. Um, it's been determined recently um, through some comparative studies that 50% of the water clarity in a lake is related to this parameter of mean depth and that uh, fish production is really well correlated to mean depth. And so you can guess, is a shallower lake or a deeper lake going to be more productive? And we said earlier that shallower lakes have more exposure to the sediment and light. So shallower lakes tend to be more productive, they have more algae, and that makes them less clear. So it's a good bet if you go to a lake and you see that it's clear, that that might be a relatively deeper lake compared to a lake that you go to that's not as clear.
Another morphometric parameter that we can calculate is relative depth. Um, and relative depth is the, a sort of strange measure, um, but it can be useful sometimes. It's the maximum depth divided by the diameter of the lake expressed as a percentage, so times 100. Um, and the center of, what this really tells you is how much closer the center is to the bottom than it is to the shore. Um, most lakes, if you have never thought about it, if you row out to the center of most lakes, um, that is, you're much, much closer to the bottom of that lake than you are to the shore. So if you went out to the middle of Lake Erie, hopefully not by rowing, perhaps by going in a motorboat, then you would be much closer to the bottom of Lake Erie than you were to the shore. And it's very rare that this value is um, more than 2%. But if you think about these shapes of a lake, it's as if you're comparing a lake that's shaped like a shallow pie pan to a lake that's shaped like a, a tumbler or a, a glass. Um, and a lake that's shaped like the lake to the left here, like a drinking glass, that lake would have a lot of area that wasn't exposed to light and it would end up being a very unusual lake. Um, and some lakes then that have relatively high um, uh, relative depth, that has a lot of relatives in that sentence, very high relative depth are Crater Lake um, that we discussed earlier and Lake Kohaku in uh, Hawaii. And these both are caldera lakes. Um, so they're lakes that were formed when the, the uh, cone of the volcano, the, the magna cone, dropped and made a very narrow cylindrical channel. And so in these lakes, they're very unproductive. And think about why those lakes are unproductive. Are they close to the bottom? How much of the lake is actually lit? Um, would, where would these lakes be getting nutrients from? So as you look at these, a lake with a high relative depth um, should be very low in productivity compared to a lake with a low relative depth. Another shape parameter that we can discuss is the length of the shoreline. Uh, the length of the shoreline is an obvious easy thing. You could measure that just by uh, measuring the length as you walked along the shoreline or you could do it uh, with more sophisticated uh, techniques. That's going to also fluctuate with the change in water level just like the um, volume of the lake will change. Um, and that's pretty intuitive. But then we have another parameter, which is term shoreline development. That term sometimes gets people confused because you think of shoreline development as how many houses are on the lake. And that certainly is one kind of human development on the shoreline. But in the sense of morphometry, shoreline development is uh, a measure of how circular the lake is or on the other hand, how non-circular the lake is, how many embayments, how much irregularity does the shoreline have. So shoreline development, which is D sub L, is defined as the length of the shoreline, so that distance as you walk along the shore, relative to the shoreline that you would get if you sort of spread this lake at the top into a perfect circle of the same surface area. So. Uh, the smallest circumference of any shape you may remember from basic geometry is that of a circle. So essentially, if you had a perfectly circular lake by this ratio, that would be equal to 1. Um, the less circular it is, the longer this shoreline is going to be um, relative to if this lake area were a, a circle. And so if it's very circular, this shoreline development is going to be much greater than 1. Um, and in a lake that has this shoreline, which is much greater than one then, you can imagine that allows for more macrophytes, more of these pond weeds that we've mentioned, and allows for more shallow areas. You might get more places for juvenile fish to hang out and so forth. So these lakes could be very different in terms of the kinds of organisms that are make, taking advantage of the lake. Another kind of parameter that we can measure for for the shape of a lake is um, looking at the relative amount of area versus depth, um, which we call hypsographic curve. Now, before we get into this too much, um, I want to just show you these backwards graphs that both limnologists and oceanographers make. The backwards graph is not a hypsographic curve, it's just the way we draw everything in this field. And it confuses people at first and after a while you'll get used to it. So we draw uh, our graphs not with the x-axis in this direction and the y-axis going up, but we draw them with the x-axis in the normal direction and the y-axis going down. 
And that's because it's as if we're taking a little chunk out of the lake. So we're looking at the factors as we're going deeper and deeper with depth. Um, so it's confusing at first, but I guarantee you in another few weeks, you'll get used to seeing these curves for everything uh, going from like the temperature as you go from the surface of the lake to the bottom of the lake, every other parameter. That's just a, a common kind of graph that we make. A hypsographic curve specifically refers to one of these curves that shows um, the depth of the lake versus the area as our parameter on the x-axis. So the depth again is going to be on our y, our backwards y-axis. We're going from the surface to the bottom of the lake. And what's the area at a sub zero, the area at the surface? So if we think about it this way, here's our lake, our little contour map of our lake. This is the area at the surface. We can see that here someone's making, made a chunk through this profile here and graph that in the vertical dimension. So we have the surface of the lake and this is what we have lines that are close to each other here. So we have a steep side here. We have a very flat bottom here. Then we get a slow rise and a slower slope on this side. These lines are farther apart. And if we plot the area at each of these depths, so the area at the surface, the area at each subsequent depth, um, all the way down to the maximum depth where there's no area below that, that's a hypsographic curve. So why would we want to know that? Um, it's useful to tell us, say, how much, uh, how much area there is in any given chunk. Um, it's also useful for us to calculate out the volume of the lake. Um, so we can get a lot of information out of this. We can tell if we have a shallow lake that has a deep hole or if we have uh, steep inclining walls and a flat bottom from the shape of this curve. And I'll show you how that works in, in the next uh, slide. So we can do these in meters squared or percent area. It doesn't matter. So this is just the absolute area in meters squared with every depth. Um, or we can do the percent area. That gives you sort of uh, more clue about the shape as well, because it tells you, obviously, you have 100% of the area at the surface. How fast does that decline? Really the same thing, but you'll see both of those in the literature. But this absolute um, area allows us to integrate under the curve, like add up. You might remember if you have meters here in depth and meters squared as your x-axis, then integrating under this curve would give us that series of truncated cones, would give us the same estimate as volume. So we can tell the percent of a lake at any given depth with the bottom uh, version of this curve. And then if we looked at, say, different theoretical shape lakes and the shape of our hypsographic curve here, you can see that if you have a hypsographic curve that is, um, is shaped like this, with this very slow slope at the beginning at the shallow areas and then a steep slope, you can see this on this map. We have a shallow, shallow area and then a deep hole. So this lake is mostly the same depth until you get to the middle and then it's got a deep hole in the middle of it. As opposed to something like Lake Tahoe, which has a really, really steep side and then a very flat bottom. That would be something like this. A very, very uh, much of the area of the lake lies below all of those contours, very steep side, and then you get this very flat bottom. So these curves can tell you, these hypsographic curves can tell you a lot about what the, uh, what the, the contour map of the lake would look like, what the, what the isobaths are shaped like. So we can then, I said we could go to, to volumes from that. Here's our little lake from a Florida lake. Here's the, our, our bathymetric map, each contour. Um, and here's the area for each of these, so the area at the surface, the area at each subsequent depth, and those are written here. And then we integrate under the curve or use that formula for a truncated cone um, that you can use that's in your reading that will let you calculate the volume of the layer. And then you could add all these volumes up and get the overall total lake volume. And then if you say wanted to estimate what would happen if the lake level decreased um, to this depth, you would add up these uh, these volumes to get the volume of the new lake that would arise with this water decreasing. You could estimate how much the water volume had decreased as well.
Similarly, you can plot depth volume curves. Not as many people do this, but you will see it, and that would just be the same backwards graphs that we make in limnology and oceanography, going from the surface to the bottom, with the relevant, uh, the relevant x-axis here being the volume instead of the area, or the percent volume. Um, and essentially, the shape of these can tell you uh, how much of the, the surface area is in contact with shallow sediments, um, because you'll have lakes that will have shallower slopes and will have more volume that's exposed to, to, to uh, shallow sediments versus ones that have less lighted volume at the surface of the lake that are exposed to sediments. So plant growth would be greater in a lake that had more sediments exposed to um, the sunlight so that plants could grow. So you'd have a weedier lake if you had a, a lake that looked more like the dotted curve here. Okay, so hopefully you've learned a bit about the shape and size of lakes, um, and we'll be talking more about those parameters throughout the rest of the class as we calculate various uh, chemical and biological processes. This next part of this, today's topic, is um, probably the driest. I'll try to make it interesting for you because uh, most science you think of as being pretty jargony to begin with. Um, for some reason, aquatic science seems to be particular jargony. We've made up terms for various types of organisms, various zones of the lake. And as you go through your textbook and your reading and your reading papers in this field and we're talking, you just need to learn these basic terms and there's no way around it. So I apologize for this being dry, but it's like learning a new language. You have to learn the language of limnology in order to understand what limnologists like I who've been thinking about this for a while are going to speak in this jargon. We'll, we'll try to explain the jargon for you. So the first part of the jargon we're going to talk about is zonation in lakes and we'll go on to some streams and organisms. So zonation in lakes, we can define if we're near shore of the lake, so this is a cutoff of the lake, you're going cross section through the shoreline and this is the open water. And the epilittoral zone, you'll hear some people say littoral, some littoral, we can argue about it, it's like potato, potato, don't worry about it. We'll know what you're talking about either way. So epi means upper, so this is entirely above um, the littoral zone. It's not affected by spray. It's really the, the shoreline of the lake that's not as affected by the water. Um, then we have the super supralittoral, so this is the next zone. And for those of you who've taken an oceanography class or marine ecology class, these relate a lot to the same kinds of terms that are used near shore, where you have tides moving up and down. Um, so this is entirely above the water, but if you have storms, um, if you have waves, it can get sprayed. So it's wetter than the rest of the, the shoreline in the epilittoral, and you get different kinds of vegetation there that tolerate or require that extra water. As we continue down along the shoreline toward the deep part of the lake, we get to the true littoral zone. And this true littoral zone here extends from the seasonal high water level down to where there's no more vegetation and that vegetation stops growing basically, basically because the light coming from the sun can't penetrate to the bottom anymore. So the, the, the littoral zone of lakes tends to look pretty weedy. It's dominated by what we would call macrophytes or big plants um, that you might have called pond weeds before you took this class. And that can be subdivided into several other zones. The U littoral or the, the true, U means true littoral zone, um, is between the seasonal high and the seasonal low water level. So this is a zone that becomes dried and exposed to the air at times and it may be relatively bare. And in some lakes and in many reservoirs, and these are some shots of reservoirs, this drawdown in the reservoir may make for a very expansive U littoral zone and not many plants can stand, not many terrestrial plants can stand being underwater Water, and not many aquatic plants can stand being out of water. So this can be a really bare zone. So that can lead to erosion and turbidity on the shoreline. Um, and so this eulatoral zone, especially in reservoirs or lakes that vary a lot in their water level seasonally, can be really important to define. And the rest of the, the zones of the littoral zone are going to be defined by the plants um, because botanists were the first to study these regions. They were interested in, in these macrophytes and these pond weeds. The upper zone is the zone where the pond weeds have their, basically their feet in the water, they're rooted, um, and they emerge out into the air. So if we look here, we've got these guys, their roots are underwater in the sediment that's, that's wetted and they stand out from the water, so they emerge from the lake. 
That's the upper littoral zone. The mid zone may not occur in many lakes, um, but when you have floating vegetation where the leaves are floating on the surface and then they have a stem or, uh, and are rooted or they may just be floating loose on the water like duckweed, that would be the mid littoral zone. So you don't have things that are emerging out of the water, but stuff that's floating on it, making nice habitat for amphibians and so forth. And then you have the lower zone as you get deeper where you don't have stuff floating on the surface or emerging out of the water, but you still have higher plants that are growing, um, angiosperms that are growing. And you can see here, this is a picture from Oneida Lake. We've got various kinds of plants. They're not breaking the surface, um, but they're growing there. Then finally, we end up with a zone um, that's the littoral profundal uh, boundary, um, which is the sediments have some things that photosynthesize, but they're not plants. They're just algae, these, these photosynthesizing forms of life. Um, so you dive further down in the lake and you'll get some green stuff, but it's not a flowering plant. It's just a, 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 an algae that has uh, less segregation into different types of body forms that we'll talk about later in class. So that's, uh, there's still a little bit of light, but not enough for a higher plant. And then we get to the profundal or the really deep area. And then there's just sediment. Often it's really loose, mucky sediment. It's free of vegetation. It's really dark, okay? And the water that's above that dark area where there are no plants, that this area here is where the sediment below it doesn't have plants or algae, that's called the pelagic or the open water zone of the lake. And the water that's lit in the pelagic zone can be, the water in the pelagic zone can be divided into the water that's lit or the euphotic, the truly lit zone, which is sometimes called the trophogenic zone or trophy means feeding and genic means created. So creating food zone. Um, and that means there's enough light here for those phytoplankton and all the algae, the green stuff in the water to actually make more, um, fix more carbon, to make more carbohydrates and more production than they use. And once you get dark enough water that essentially the algae are not able to sustain excess growth, that's the trophilytic zone or the um, feed breaking down zone. And that's where more things are respiring. There are more animals than primary producers. And this fish, say, might wander between those two different zones in the lake. They're not constrained to one area. In streams, we have some slight differences, and this is the idealized stream. We have a true spring or a eucrenon, which is the point of origin of a stream. Not every stream is spring-fed, um, but we can imagine if for a spring-fed stream, you'd have that point of, of springs feeding it. Then as you go down from that, um, you get a brook that's leaving the stream. Um, and uh, this has sort of similar influences often. It's just further away. Often the, the part that we would define as the eucrinon has very constant water temperature because the water is coming from the groundwater. And you start getting more influences of, say, the sun shining down on the stream, uh, heating the water as you move down into the hypocrinon. Then we get to the Rithron, or what we call the stony stream zone. And uh, this is a zone that all of you trout fishermen can probably relate to. The water's still cold, uh, but you're getting into this area that you have a uh, nice habitat for some of the salmonids and other fish, but usually very fast flowing and relatively cool temperature. And then again, in this idealized stream, we can move further downstream till we get to what we call the Potamon. Poda means river. You can think of a Hippopotamus actually means river horse. Um, so Potamon means river, and so this is where you get to what you call an actual uh, river. You would define it as a river. It's still a gradient to a river. There's no one point we can say it stops being a stream and becomes a river. Um, but this is a place where you have high velocity, but sort of lower energy. The water is moving out, expanding. Um, there's a shallower gradient, so it's not flowing as rapidly down a slope. And there's a lot of deposition. So instead of being rocky at the bottom, these rivers would have uh, more. And on average more deposition, more silty bottoms. And then when you get below that, uh, you get to where, say, an idealized river might enter the sea and have tidal influences, and that would be a hypodamon or beneath the, uh, beneath the river. Um, and so this is an estuary, and we'll talk about estuaries more specifically later in the class. Uh, Hudson River is, is a good example of an estuary in New York State uh, where you have the river coming to uh, the mouth of the ocean uh, at New York City.
So if we're going to classify streams, another way that we classify streams is not only by these terms, but also by the order of a river. You've probably seen um, some uh, descriptions of a stream as being a first or second order stream, and you may not have known what that meant. Um, basically, we can define streams. A, a stream that is a primary stream flows year round. And if you have two streams that flow year round that meet, um, then we can call that a second order stream. So you'll find then if two second order streams meet, we call that a third order stream. If we get, say, a first order stream entering the third order stream, um, we do not redefine that. So we have two first order streams here that make a second order stream. We have a second order stream entering a third order stream and another second order stream. That doesn't increase the order. It would take another third order stream entering this stream to make this a fourth order stream. So sometimes people will argue about what a stream order is, which can be confusing. You're like, why is there disagreement? But sometimes that's because this, these little streams that are feeding it, the first order streams, there may be disagreement about whether they truly flow year round or not. Um, so in the U.S., um, the Mississippi is generally thought of as a 10th order river, although some might categorize it as a, a higher order river based on those differences in those first order twigs and their status. Twigs and, their status. Um, and the Amazon, for instance, would be a, a 12th order river. Another zone that we can define that's related to streams and rivers and, and also lakes and wetlands um, are riparian zones. And these are just loosely defined in many cases as zones that are influenced by the presence of water. And they also influence the water because if they're vegetated, they can provide a buffer from materials that are entering from the watershed. Um, and so riparian zones have been very important in management. Um, many states have different management regulations for what constitutes a riparian zone. And if there are rules that determine whether riparian zones are vegetated or not vegetated, that can determine how much influence, say, development in the watershed, in this case, I mean, development by houses being built or erosion from, from roads that are improperly built and so forth, whether that's going to run directly into the stream or river, wetland or lake, or whether that's going to be intercepted by vegetation, whether nutrients can be taken up by vegetation. So there's been a lot of emphasis on management of healthy riparian zones to improve water quality. And you can see as you're flying over the country sometime, if you take a transatlantic, uh, not a transatlantic flight, then you just see the ocean. If you take a transcontinental flight, you will notice as you go from state to state, real differences in what the terrain looks like. And if we notice, I took this shot as traveling across the country, you can see where the rivers are just by the, the leaving of the only trees in this area uh, around the rivers. And you could almost trace the rivers based on the riparian zones that had been required by management regulations in this area. Um, and so there's there are different, different uh, riparian boundaries that are defined in different areas. And next time, if you're taking a flight, look out the window and see if you can estimate whether you're in a place that has a large or a small riparian zone based on what the pattern of the landscape looks like. And we'll talk about how that affects water chemistry and organisms later in the class. So let's look at some biological groups. Those are just the names of the habitats, but what biological groups are associated with each of those places? In the open water of the lake, um, the pelagic zone, we can define a few things. All of the particles in the water of the lake are defined, are called ceston. And Ceston, you can imagine all the particles in the lake, are, is composed of stuff that's alive, which is biocestan, that's easy to remember, and stuff that's dead, um, or stuff that never was alive, like sediments. So the stuff that um, was dead or not ever living or is called tripton. The stuff that once was alive, we can subclassify sub as detritus. Detritus is one of the two parts of, of tripton, along with the sediments. And ceston itself then is really not a good descriptor of a type of organism or a type of thing. It's really an operational definition, what we call. Basically, you take various kinds of filters and you see what lands on the filter and then the water passes through. And all the goo that's left there is 
sassed on. So it's a really unspecific term. It's just particles in the water. So we can get a little more specific about what are the components of that, and we'll learn about the different organisms in the biological part of the class. But some of the particles in the water that are these, this bio um, include stuff that a lot of you guys are really interested in, necton. These are organisms that can swim and control their own fate as to where they are in the water column. They create turbulence, they can move around, they're not moved by tides. This includes fish that you guys are interested in. It also can include some large, really robust invertebrates that are able to swim powerfully and avoid being moved around. So, those are nekton. Then we have plankton. Plankton means wanderer in Greek. Um, and a true plankton or a euplankton is going to spend its whole life in the pelagic. So this is something that's really, really different than uh, something on terrestrial systems. We don't have things that spend their whole life flying around, never touching the ground. We have birds that will fly around in the sky and land on trees and so forth. We have insects that fly around and land in places, but we don't have the equivalent of plankton that are just flying around and never landing on Earth. So these are always in the water, suspended in the water. And we can subdivide those plankton into bacteria that are in the water, like this E. coli, which is a, can be a, a very hazardous bacteria, but we have lots and lots of non-hazardous bacteria. Those are bacteria plankton. Then the photosynthesizing organisms that are plankton, these small photosynthetic organisms, the little plants of the lake and also of oceans, we call phytoplankton, plant plankton. And then these little tiny uh, organisms that are animals floating around in the lake, we call zooplankton. British people will say zooplankton. Um, this is a copepod, which is actually the most abundant herbivore on Earth. So these copepods are uh, types of copepods are the dominant grazers in the world's oceans, in lakes. And so you might think a deer or a rabbit is the most abundant herbivore on Earth, but actually it's this little copepod that's only a few millimeters in size. So we'll learn more about those guys. In addition, uh, larval fish can be zooplankton if they don't swim very well. So for some period of their life, they be, may be buffeted about um, wandering around without control. They can, be, they can swim, they can move up and down perhaps, but they can't resist a strong current. We also have a few other kinds of plankton that can potentially enter the, the open waters, but they don't spend their whole lives there. Um, these are miroplankton. Um, that is a kind of organism that um, lives on a, the sediments at some point. It has to have a stage of its life cycle where it's going to come in contact with the sediments. Um, and a good example of this are some, uh, or it could also have a stage of its life cycle where, it's tr where it flies around and is not in the water. So it has to be some stage that it's not in the open water. It's either in the sediments or it's flying around uh, the atmosphere and, and being more of a terrestrial organism. A good example of this is this pretty cool little insect larvae, Chaeobarus, the phantom midge larvae, uh, which is about a centimeter, centimeter and a half long. It actually acts like a little insect juvenile pike, and it is a sit and wait predator, and it'll eat other plankton with these mouth parts. We'll talk about it later. And when it matures, it metamorphoses into a phantom midge that flies around and uh, doesn't bite you, uh, but you may have seen or learned about in entomology. Um, also, there are things that you'll find as animals and photosynthesizing organisms in a lake that just get swept there accidentally. Um, so you'll find them when you're collecting things, but they don't really make a living there. They're sort of accidentally there. Um, and those are uh, pseudoplankton. They're pretending to be plankton, basically. They ended up there in a flood. Uh, and so that's important just because uh, it's important to classify them as different than things that are normally found in the, in the water. It may help us uh, quantify effects of, say, flooding uh, and other disasters or know how the lakes change or the streams change when pseudoplankton are washed into the system. We also have stuff that lives at the bottom of a lake or a stream. These things are called benthos. These are organisms that live at the interface of the sediment at the bottom of the lake and the water. And again, we can define things that are photosynthesizing, like this macroalgae, um, green things that are growing there, um, like the macrophytes we talked about. And we can define things that are animals, like these zoobenthos. 
Um, and so they are living at the bottom of the sediments. Um, they have a lot of access to nutrients there. And there can often be a whole sub-food web of organisms that lives at this sediment water interface. Other kinds of groups can exploit the other interface uh, that's at the surface of a lake. And you can think that you've seen these in a lake or a stream, uh, things like water striders. These are pluston that live at the air and water interface. So you can see we exploit the surface tension at the surface, that this little guy can uh, scoot around the surface tension as if it's an actual surface. But we also have a whole bunch of microscopic pluston called nuston that are living at that surface. Little protozoans, amoebas, all kinds of photosynthetic organisms. Next time you're in a lake and you have a, a snorkel mask on, or if you don't have one, borrow someone's, take a look at that surface and you'll notice that that film is covered with a whole bunch of organisms that are exploiting that air-water interface and the surface tension there, um, eating bacteria and other particles that fall into the water. And it's a whole little micro community and things in the lake itself will often exploit those as food. Those of you who are fly fishermen also may know that some of the things you're putting in that would hang out on the pluston are bait for your, your trout that you're trying to catch. Finally, we have a few other kinds of groups. Um, we have algae, um, so photosynthesizing organisms that aren't higher plants, and some bacteria that live on other surfaces. And we can define a few types of paraphyton. These are really important. If you've ever uh, walked in a stream and like slipped on a rock uh, and cursed why it was slippery, you've cursed paraphyton, even if you didn't know what that was. So these algae are really productive often. They grow on surfaces. There'll be bacteria growing there with them. If they're growing on a plant, they're called epiphytic. If they're growing on, so phyte, remember, is plant, so they're on the plant, of surface of the plant. Epipelic ones are growing on sediment. This is soft substrate. So here's our little algae growing on that sediment that we saw in the littoral profundal zone. That was an epipelic algae, epipelic paraphyton. And then if they're growing on rocks, epilithic, lith is rocks. Think of like the Paleolithic period, the or it was a Stone Age. These little algae are growing on these rocks and there's a whole host of other organisms that are, are eating them as well. So we'll talk more about paraphyton. Um, and then we can have epizoic organisms that live on animals. Um, I like, this is dramatic sort of to, to show our last thing. Polar bears can have epizoic algae. So a polar bear is an animal. And these the polar bears actually look white, but they have uh, hollow hairs that are transparent. But sometimes you'll see a polar bear, this one's in a zoo, that has a green looking fur. And that's because algae have taken a ride on this, this polar bear and settled in the hairs to grow. It's hard for something else to eat them. They're safe if they're living inside the polar bear's hair. Uh, so they're epizoic algae. Also, we have things that live on and in the sediments. And for those of you interested in stream ecology, these are really important in stream food webs that we'll talk about. So we have things that live on sand surfaces, and we have not sam, those are called episamic, and not salmon like the fish that you might want to catch, but salmon, P-S-A-M-M-O-N, are also sometimes called interstitial fauna. Interstices are the spaces between objects. And these organisms actually live in the spaces beneath the grains on the bottom of the sediments. So this is a nematode or roundworm, and that's an amphipod. Some of you might call it a scud, a little crustacean. And they're all specialized to live in the bottom. So if you go digging around in the, the substrate, the bottom of these surfaces, you'll find these organisms. So what we're going to do in the rest of this class, once you've learned these names, is we're going to be talking about how these food webs work. You'll know we've got the littoral zone, the pelagic zone, we've got paraphyton growing on substrates. These would be um, epiphytic paraphyton growing on a plant. We've got the necton, we've got benthic stuff. We're going to put all that together in a food web and we're going to look at how these interact with nutrient cycles, with the physical processes in the lake, and be able to do some predictions of what will happen as we manage lakes and streams differently. So it's important to remember these terms, to think about the shapes of your systems as we're trying to put all of these things together to better understand how lake and stream ecosystems work. So even though it's a little tedious to memorize these names, try to get a sense of it because we'll be referring to these names in 
in more, uh, more commonly in the rest of the class as we try to describe lake and stream ecosystems and how to better manage them and understand the scientific background behind their management. Thanks, and I'll see you later in class.